Hey everyone, uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Brandon Thompson and welcome to our online service uh, here at Ember Tide. And so thanks so much for being a part of this. Uh, today is a special Sunday. It's a Covenant Partner Sunday. And if you are a regular here at Ember Tide and you're watching online, uh, you'll understand that this is kind of a big Sunday for us. Uh, if I know that some of you are away or you can't join us in person because of uh, health reasons or for a lot of other different reasons. Uh, and so I want to remind you that if you're interested in being a covenant partner uh, and getting one of these covenant partner cards uh, to fill out, uh, you can simply do that by commenting in the comment section below, whether on Facebook or on YouTube. Or you can just go to our website and go to the contact us tab and you'll get a hold of me and we'll be able to have a conversation. So I'd love to invite you to pursue one of those options. Before we jump into our service though, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about uh, our vision. Um, in September of 2021, we launched our reimagined vision and it was probably one of the hardest times to launch anything. Uh, because we were right in the heart of the pandemic. Everything was, you know, one week we're meeting in person, the next meet we're, week we're not. Um, everything was just kind of getting lost and all the buzz about, you know, vaccinations and everything. But we, we pursued it and we wanted to keep going because we felt that God was leading us to go forward. And so we wanted to just share a little bit of those, uh, pro the progress that we've made on some of those vision goals. And I wanted to take a few minutes and just talk to you about it. And you'll see up on your screen, we have uh, just kind of organized them into three different categories. Um, and these are kind of our main um, mission statements. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. And so we've organized all of our, our vision elements underneath those uh, categories. So the first one is be with Jesus. And we made the goal uh, the vision to try and set up and develop a strategy to launch a hybrid church, a church that was both online and in person. And the good news is we've launched that. You're watching it right now. You're a part of this. And so thank you for being a part of it. But we're still refining it. We're still trying to make it better. We're still trying to figure out what's the best way to do this, to keep people engaged and not just uh, consuming content. Uh, so that's an ongoing process, but we've, we're really happy that we've made it so far through this. We want to engage with 100 average viewers through our online services. And so right now we're getting really close to that. We're averaging about 72 viewers a week. And so that's good news. We're, we're on our way. Development of consistent corporate and individual prayer opportunities. And so this is something that we're still working on. Um, we're seeing some traction now with our suburban monastery. And we think that that might be one way to kind of address creating this culture of prayer in our church and becoming a praying church. Um, and so we're, we're happy with how it's going, but there's still lots of room for improvement there. Um, engagement with 100 new people and identify them by name from outside the church through all of our ministries. One of the things that we became aware of when we started working on this was that we need to cultivate a way to be able to track some of those things. And we haven't got that nailed down yet. Um, we've had lots of contact with people outside the church, but we just haven't had a way to measure it in a practical and kind of realistic way. And so we're, that's one of our focuses for 2022 is just to make sure that we find a way to be able to start tracking you know, newcomers and when they start arriving and, and that sort of thing. So that's being with Jesus. The next one is become like Jesus. And so the vision elements for this were 75% of regular attenders engaged in some form of community. So whether that's life groups or the suburban monastery or something else. And we're currently seeing at approximately 35%. Um, so we're about halfway there and we're excited about that. We're excited to see how many people are getting on board with our suburban monastery. We are just pleased to see how people are connecting again and moving in that direction towards, you know, valuing community. We also wanted to measure 200 next steps, whether that's first time visits, connections, life groups, or contributions to ministries or commitments to Christ or baptisms any of those things fall under the next steps 
And again, we just don't have the right method for tracking this yet. Have these happened? Yes, we've seen some of these things happen, but we just don't have the right way to track it. So that is one of the ways that we're, that's one of the things we are exploring in 2022. And then finally, do what Jesus did. And so here's the third part of our, our vision. And that's where we wanted to see 10% of our income to go right back out the door. Um, if we're going to uh, ask you to tithe 10% of your income to the church, we want to set the model for that for you as a church by giving 10% of our income to those uh, in, outside of the church. And so we're doing that. We've budgeted for that. We make that a part of our giving and we're on track for that. <clears throat> 500 hours of service in the community in 2022. Again, this is all about tracking and we're looking at trying to find ways. Are, are we serving in the community? In lots of different ways we are, but we haven't had a chance to be able to kind of track that. And so we're finding ways to do that in 2022. Connections with three local organizations with opportunity to serve. And we've identified those three and we're trying in our best ways to kind of get connected with those uh, different organizations and to be able to love on them and to be able to support them. So we're on track with that. Then uh, launch one fresh expression. And we tried to do this in the fall of 2021 with our micro church initiative. We learned lots of great things about micro churches and it's still a door that's open. Uh, we just need to find the right time to step through that and the right people who are interested in setting that up again. And so we are thrilled to have been able to experiment with that. And I love that we're a church that wants to experiment and try new things and risk things. And so I, I am just thrilled with how that went. And I think it'll be a great uh, resource for us going forward. Micro churches are not done. They're only gonna become more important in the years to come. And then finally, the selection of a marketplace ministry. And this actually has happened faster than we thought it was gonna be. This was gonna happen lower in our, you know, in our timeline. But what we're seeing now is that a great opportunity has come before us and we're in the process of discovering what that might be and if it's possible and feasible for us to do uh, within our building. And so that we're really, we're really excited about what that might look like uh, as it comes into fruition in 2022. And so you'll be able to hear more about that in the days to come. So I wanted to just share those vision updates with you. I mean, first of all, my first impression after I look at those things is that I can't believe how much we got accomplished in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, it can feel like during those days, it felt like you were just slogging through everything, just trying to keep your head above water. But in fact, God was faithful and allowed us to move on some specific things. And so to, the fact that we got anything accomplished over the past two years is phenomenal. Uh, but to see the amount in which we've moved forward here on this vision uh, is, is exciting for me. And you should feel encouraged and I'm encouraged about that. There are some things that we need to tidy up around administration and how to track things. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, and there's lots of room for growth. But one of the things that also has become apparent to us is that we need to now start refocusing again on what the next level of vision is going to be, what the next phase of, of this vision would be. And so we're going to be starting that process in the fall. And so it's, it's great to be able to accomplish so many things and, and it's kind of led us to start refocusing. What, what are the big things, the big rocks we want to tackle uh, over the next uh, three to five years? Um, and so we ask you to join us in, in praying about those things. Um, and we still have lots of things to go on our reimagined vision, but it's already time to start thinking about what the next, what the next leg of the journey is going to be for Ember Tide. And so we are excited about that. Uh, we're, we're inviting you to be praying for us and, and joining in with us in that vision process. And you'll be hearing lots more uh, in the months to come. So as we spend this time just thinking about the vision and, and rededicating ourselves in this Covenant Partner Sunday, uh, I just want to give thanks to God for what He's done in our lives and what He's done here in Hampton, in Embertide. And uh, it's just been a, a miracle to see what God has done. And so we want to just give thanks back to Him. And so would you join me in praying and just offering up thanks to God? 
Father, as we look at how you've sustained us over the last, uh, you know, two years, uh, over the last year of this vision during the pandemic, God, we have just seen time and time again your provision, your goodness, your faithfulness, the way that you're drawing people to yourself. Um, God, you are good, and we just want to thank you for all that you've done. Lord, your desire is to see everyone in this Hampton area come to know you. And so, God, we, we know what the mission is in front of us. We know what it means uh, to live out the Great Commission in our area. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us to do that by being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And, Lord, we ask that you would use Ember Tide for your glory, not for ours, but for your glory. Uh, so that people might come to know you and hear the story of your love. And so, God, we just pray for direction and for wisdom and for vision uh, over the next uh, months as we begin to start this process in the fall. And we pray, God, that you would lead us and guide us in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, we pray these things together. Amen.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Today is a fun Sunday for me to talk about uh, our, our church. I love talking about, you know, just vision and direction and purpose. And for me, Covenant Partner Sunday is just one day where we just kind of rally the troops around our, our vision and our mission and our core. Uh, and it's a chance for us just to say, hey, yeah, I'm in. I'm ready to recommit. Let's do this. We're all rowing in the same direction. And so it's kind of like a big rah-rah kind of Sunday. It's a big Sunday where we celebrate, you know, what God has done. And you've heard me share already just how God has been faithful so far. Um, but I want to just spend some time talking about the heart of Ember Tide and what that means for us and, and how we organize ourselves around that heart and that mission. And really from the beginning, the time that our church was planted a dozen or so years ago, the goal has always been for us to be able to bring Christ to Hampton, you know, to bring the gospel to this area and, and to, to live out the Great Commission in this region. Um, and so that has always been our heart. And, and we've used in the past, as we've talked about vision, the image of an aircraft carrier. You've heard me talk about this before, where we are, you know, the church serves as this launching pad for uh, Christ's disciples to go and to do the work that he's called us to do, to live out the Great Commission. And so that's kind of the heart around what Ember Tide is all about. We want to be a launch pad, a chance for us to, to send people out uh, into the mission. And so we've kind of organized ourselves around three key mission statements. To be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. Those are the three kind of organizing principles around everything that we do. Uh, you heard our, our vision was organized around those three things. That is why we exist. And when I moved here, you know, eight or so years ago, uh, one of the questions that always kept me up at night, one of the things that I was always praying about and racking my brain about was how do we reach people uh, in Hampton? How do we reach people and show the love of Christ uh, in a way that they'll respond to the gospel? Uh, in, a, in a kind of a, a situation and a context where a lot of folks have everything that they could physically want, um, and yet how do we show them that there is something more to that? And I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that when we spend time being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did, we will be able to reach the people uh, that God has put in front of us in our circles of influence. Um, I am convinced that it is only through that manner 
that we will be able to see any kind of breakthrough in the lives of the people that, that we want to reach. Um, what if it was as simple as understanding the fact that if we took our relationship with Christ seriously and live that out, then, then people around us would see that there is something different about us, right? That if we took time to be with Jesus and cultivate a deep and meaningful relationship with Christ, that would then be able to shape how we, how we live and how we respond and how we act, you know, to become like Jesus, uh, and, and then allow that to be able to just outflow from our lives into the things that we do and, and do what Jesus did, we could see radical change in our communities. Uh, and so to me, and, and as, a, as a leader here at Ember Tide, it is all about those three things. Being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And so we kind of organize ourselves around those things. But we also have something to kind of help us accomplish that mission um, we've created here at Ember Tide something that we call covenant partnership. And covenant partnership is really all about a call for you, uh, for me, for us who call Ember Tide a church home. Uh, it's a call for us to make a commitment. It's a call for us to take another step. It's a commitment to God, and it's also a commitment to each other. And so each year we spend time recommitting. Uh, refocusing and allow ourselves to be reminded of this covenant that we've made with each other. And it also serves some practical purposes as well. So don't get me wrong. It does allow us to be able to accomplish some important things. And so there are some similarities to, to what, for those of you who have been around the church, what we would call church membership, you know. There are some similar uh, avenues around that. But it's also... Uh, I think it's important for us to kind of push off the assumption that covenant partnership is just our fancy way of saying uh, church membership. It's, n it's not that simple. It's not that uh, cut and dry. Um, and so I want to kind of push back against that assumption a little bit for two reasons. One is that I know many of you and, and many of you who are watching this and many of you who are with us in person have been hurt by the church and, and never want to be a member of a church again. Um, your history is one where church membership is a dirty word, you know, where it just brings back so many bad memories. And so we want to be clear that, that some of the things that brought about that hurt for you are not what it means to be a covenant partner. The second, I think, is, is we want the focus to be totally different than church membership. We want our, our focus to be turned in an, the opposite direction of where it might be focused in on church membership. And I'll kind of explain a little bit more about that as we get into it. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Brandon, like, none of this is even biblical. There's no church membership in the Bible. There's nothing. This is just kind of like a man-made kind of construct. And you're right. You're not going to see uh, thou shalt become a church member uh, in, in the Bible. And you're not going to see anything about covenant partnership in the Bible. But what you are going to see is throughout the New Testament and throughout the early church, you're going to see the church organizing itself. You're going to find, see that in different passages. So let me just give you a couple. Acts chapter 2, at the very beginning, you start to see a numerical account of people who have started to become followers of Jesus and are added to the church. In Acts chapter 6, you see elections happening to address specific situations. You see people brought into uh, a different role to be able to address a specific situation in the church. And then in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, you read about a, a program that's developed to help widows uh, receive care in, in the church in Ephesus. And so you see, like, throughout this, this early church process of its growth, you start to see it become organized and, and kind of organize itself around those things. And, and one thing you will see throughout the Bible is the mention of covenants. And a covenant is a very biblical idea. 
Uh, and so what we're trying to address is one, there are important ways that we need to organize ourselves. And also we want to bring in this idea of, of covenanting together. And that's where covenant partnership kind of finds its, its roots in the scripture. And so let me just spend a little bit of time breaking down what a covenant partnership is all about. And so we're going to do that just by looking at the two words, covenant and partners, uh, spending most of our time looking at covenants, to be honest. Um, but I want to make sure that we're clear about what it means to be a covenant partner and, and seeing the biblical roots in it. So the first thing we're going to look at is Deuteronomy chapter 29. Uh, and Deuteronomy is this passage where Moses is, is sharing again with the Israelites uh, the law, the covenant that they've made with God on Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy literally means the second telling of the law. Um, and so Moses is kind of giving them uh, these last bits of, of important advice in order to move forward into the promised land. And so he's retelling the covenant given in Sinai. And I'm picking up at verse 9. And this is what it says. Therefore, obey the terms of this covenant so that you will prosper in everything you do. All of you tribal leaders, elders, officers, all the men of Israel are standing today in the presence of the Lord, our, your God. Your little ones and your wives are with you as well as the foreigners living among you who chop your wood and carry your water. You're standing here today to enter the covenant of the Lord, your God. The Lord is making this covenant, including the curses. By establishing into the covenant today, he will establish you as his people and confirm that he is your God, just as he promised you and as he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you hear the word covenant, that sounds like a really old word to me, doesn't it? I mean, we don't see examples of modern day covenants very often. We don't use that word anymore. We don't see really too many examples of in real life uh, live that out. Uh, the, the closest we have is a marriage covenant. Uh, and we all know how well marriages are going these days. Uh, so it's not even a great example of, of what a covenant is all about. But at the, we see what the heart of the covenant is all about in verse 13. And this is what verse 13 says. By entering into the covenant today... He will establish you as his people and confirm that he is your God, just as he promised you, as he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so in this verse, verse 13, we hear this language of love and of intimacy. You know, I, he is going to be uh, your people and he is going to be our God. So there's this kind of idea of, of this meshing of deep and intimate kind of relationship. It's personal. So a covenant is personal. Uh, it goes deeper than just kind of a, a business transaction. It's relational. It's intimate. And it's beyond a legal kind of contract. It's more binding um, and more accountable than a personal relationship, though. And so you see this kind of blending together of, of law and love. And so today's relationships don't really seem to have a lot of these things. If we look around in our culture today, um, most of the time our relationships are marked by individual happiness and by individual rights. And the mentality really is that, that I will be what I should be as long as you are what you should be. And if you stop being what you should be, I'm out. That's kind of the kind of terms of how we do relationships these days. This idea that, you know, as long as you keep up your end of the bargain, I'll keep up mine. The minute you don't, I'm out of here. And that's, uh, that's important to know because a covenant is different than that. It is totally different than that. A covenant is saying, I will be what I should be, whether you live up to your end of the bargain or not. It's like, I'm going to commit to this no matter what you do. I will be here. And so this is a big commitment. And so when we enter into a covenant together, when we enter into a covenant, like whether it's a marriage one or whether it's like this with a covenant partnership, it's saying, I am not after my needs. I am after your needs. And when both parties are involved in that, when both parties have that attitude, 
It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It is deep and rich and personal. And so it's a wonderful thing when we're both willing to say, I'm in this for you, not for me. And we see this kind of blending of law and love. Now, also, if you read, if you read through that, that whole section in, in Deuteronomy 29, you'll see that there are things that, that might make you feel a little bit awkward, like talking about curses and talking about consequences. And, and first of all, we need to recognize that, yeah, there are consequences to, to breaking a covenant. Um, and yet we see this wonderful picture in Genesis 15, um, where it's kind of alluded in, Je- in Deuteronomy 29, where it says, you know, I made this oath to Abraham and the, and the list of the descendants. And, and when God makes that oath to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, what they do is this, this really interesting thing. Um, and, and it sounds kind of weird from our point, but in this context, when, when it was written, uh, the covenant was sealed, was signed by cutting up animals in half and making like an alley with, with each side of the animal on, on each side. And the people involved in the covenant would walk through the middle of those things and they would make an oath and they would say, you know what, if I break the covenant, may, like I, let me end up like these animals. You know, like I recognize the consequence of this is that I'm going to end up like these animals, bloody and cut up and you know, torn into, like, my death will be the result if I break this covenant. And so what's interesting is when you see what happens in this part in Genesis 15. You know, Abraham is supposed to, in in traditional kind of covenant ceremonies, both parties would walk through. But in this case, God himself goes through the alley and walks between those things as he makes this promise that, you know, Abraham, I'm going to be your God. You are going to be my people. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You're going to be a blessing to the nations um, through your family. And, and what's amazing is that God takes on the consequences of that broken covenant. And what you're going to see throughout the Old Testament is that the people, the family of Abraham, the nation of Israel, are going to break the covenant all the time. They're going to bust it open. They're just going to disobey. They're going to pursue other gods. And so, you know, by, by regular covenant regulations in the Old Testament, you know, Abraham and his whole family should have suffered the consequences. But, and so we see this tension, you know, like what, what happens? Like God says, you know, you've broken the covenant. I'm going to curse you. And then, but at the same time, he says, I'm always going to lift you up. I'm always going to be your God. And how does that tension get resolved? And, and Timothy Keller talks about how this, this tension is what carries the story through the Old Testament. And it's only when we get to the life of Jesus that we see this covenant being fulfilled. When Jesus at the Last Supper says, This is my body. This is my blood. A sign of a new covenant, uh, you know, sealed in my blood. And so what Jesus does is he shows us that in this covenant language, I am going to bear the penalty for this broken covenant. So just as when God was walking through that alley of animal parts, you know, now Jesus lives that out and says, you know what, I'm going to die on the cross and pay the penalty for all the sins that people have made that have broken the covenant with God. It's this beautiful picture of the gospel all wrapped up in in this covenant idea. And so I want to make sure that you understand the clarity around what it means to be a covenant partner, to be involved in a covenant. It's to say that because of what Jesus has done for me, I'm willing to lay aside what my interests are and I'm going to pursue what is best for you, what God has called me to do for you, what God has called to do for us at Ember Tide. You know, I'm going to live for that. And so this idea of covenant is something deep and rich and meaningful and important. And it's a big ask, I understand that, to make that kind of commitment. But then we're also called to be partners in this. We're called to be partners. And we use that language very intentionally, this idea of partnership. We didn't call it covenant membership. We don't want that. 
Um, because when you think of membership, you think of benefits. You think of what can I get from this? You know, this exchange, I'm going to give you something and in return, I'm going to get something that's, that's not what we're looking for. That's not what we want to pursue. This question of what do I get out of this? Instead, we want to kind of push back against the consumer mentality. And as a partner, the language around partnership is so much different. It is to say, you know, how can I help? How can I come alongside and be involved? Instead of like, what do I get? What can I contribute to this? And that's what we're, we're asking covenant partners to do. In, in membership, you know, we talk about what are my rights? What do, the, what do I have the right to since I'm a member now? Whereas in, in, in partnership, in covenant partnership, we're talking about what are my responsibilities? What are the things that I need to be responsible for? And so as covenant partners, the expectations are that, that you're going to be a regular giver, that you're going to be uh, donating to the, to the mission of Ember Tide, that you're going to be involved in the major decision-making moments that we have here at the church, that you're invested, that you're not just going to be a sideline attender, that you're going to be involved and serving and being a part of the ministry here, and that you're also allowing yourself to be voluntarily held accountable uh, to the church leadership. So let's say when something happens, we need to be held accountable for, for what's gone down. We need to be able to say, all right, this is where I'm at and, and to be able to work things out. So many horror stories from the church happen because we're not willing to be held accountable to what's going on. And so that's one of our ways of, of making sure that, you know, that if ever a problem did arise, that we would be able to be held accountable to what's going on. And so some of you might have some questions about what it means to be a covenant partner. And so I've, I've got just like a little quick list of frequently asked questions, things that people might have about it. Um, the first one is, who can be a covenant partner? And a covenant, you can be a covenant partner if you're a follower of Jesus and you've demonstrated that through believer's baptism. Um, and those are the requirements to be a covenant partner. Uh, and so we, we want to make sure that everyone who is a covenant partner is a committed follower of Christ. A second question, if I don't, if I don't sign up to be a covenant partner this time, do I have to wait a whole year to become a covenant partner? And the answer is no, you don't. Uh, you can talk to me, talk to one of the elders, and you can set up a time and we'll meet together with you to have a conversation about you know, where you're at, what it means to be a covenant partner, and then go from there. Another question is, if I don't come, become a covenant partner, can I still serve in the church? Yes, absolutely. You can still serve in the church. There's lots of opportunities to serve. What it does mean, though, is that if you're not a covenant partner, um, there are uh, limits to ways in which you can serve. So not not necessarily limits in what you can serve, but there are roles that are reserved for covenant partners uh, who are in kind of higher level leadership positions. So if I'm a covenant partner, another question is, if I'm, an, if I'm a covenant partner, am I a covenant partner for life? Uh, and the answer is no, you're not. Uh, one of the reasons we do this every year is because we recognize that sometimes our priorities change. Um, that we can't make commitments that we want to make or, or we were in a spot where we couldn't and now we are in a spot where we can make a commitment. Um, and so we do it every year and every year it's renewed. Um, and so if you were a covenant partner last year, it doesn't guarantee that you're a covenant partner this year. Um, and so that's flexible and fluid. And so it's constantly changing. And so finally, the last question is, you know, what am I committing to? What am I actually committing to? As a, if I join, uh, if I become this covenant partner, what am I covenanting to? And so I want to make uh, uh, just a quick little comments about what you're actually committing to. And they're all laid out on our covenant cards. And you'll have that to take home with you, uh, if, you if you choose to be a covenant partner. Um, and here's what, they, here's what you're kind of committing to. First is community. You're committing to being a part of uh, an active group of people that you're involved with, that you're sharing life with. You're seeking out people that you can build community with uh, and that you realize that you aren't to do this all by yourself, that you aren't to go through life by yourself. The second thing that you're committing to is spiritual formation, um, that you're not just going to you know, 
leave your spiritual life alone, that you're never going to do anything, but that you're committed to growing in your faith and allowing the Holy Spirit to shape you uh, as you subscribe to being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. The next one is celebration, and this is a fun one um, because the, the... the heart behind celebration is Thanksgiving. And so we think that's important. We want to celebrate what God is doing in our midst. And so we want to be committed to that. Um, we want to take every chance we can to celebrate God's goodness and make a big deal out of it. Uh, and so today is one of those days where we want to make a big deal about what God is doing. And so we're, we're calling you to celebrate. The next one is kindness. And this might seem like a no-brainer. But in, you know, if you talk to people outside of the church, one of the things that you often get is that people who call themselves Christians are grumpy and they're, they're, they're agitated and they're uh, always complaining and grumbling. And so with this idea of kindness, it means that we're committed to being tender and kind with each other inside the church and outside the church and that we want to cultivate this this environment of kindness when we gather together. Uh, And so we need to to work towards that. Then brokenness. And this is understanding that, hey, listen, we all come from uh, a story of brokenness. The gospel tells us that we are all sinners. Uh, And so all of us have baggage. All of us have issues that we're bringing to the community. All of us uh, will have stuff that we have to work through. And it's just being honest and recognizing that none of us is perfect, but that in the midst of our brokenness, God is using that to tell a story of his goodness and his redemption uh, and allowing um, the brokenness of our lives to be a vehicle for which uh, we can share the good news of God's love and extend grace to each other uh, because we recognize we're all broken. And then finally, conflict transformation. And the idea that conflict is a bad thing, uh, we want to kind of push back against that. We think conflict has the power to bring transformation into our lives if we're open and honest and humble with it. And so as followers of Jesus and, and covenant partners here at Embertide, we're committed to the conflict resolution process that Jesus lays out in Matthew 18 and that we are going to do our best to handle conflict quickly and uh humbly and with grace and dignity and to be able to live out um, that kind of mandate that Jesus gives us in Matthew 18. So those are the things that we're asking you to commit to. And they're not earth shattering things. They're not, uh, you know, super intense, but what they are is that they, they are, you know, kind of guardrails to help us live out the mission that we are called to here at Ember Tide. Um, and to bring us together uh, and to allow us to be able to live with each other in community um, and to be able to, to carry out the mission that, that God has given us. And so I want to invite you to pray about whether you are uh, entering into a covenant partnership with us. And we'd love to have you. Uh, we pray that God would move in your hearts and that he would stir you towards uh, making this kind of commitment. We also get, if you're not there yet, that's okay too. Um, and you are always welcome at Ember Tide. And so please, if you feel like you're not ready to be a covenant partner yet, please don't understand that that means you are no longer welcome at Ember Tide. That is not the message that we are sending whatsoever. We want you here. We want you to be involved. Um, and we we're always asking people to take what is that next step that they need to take. And, and so for some of us, Covenant partnership is that next step of commitment. And so we want to invite you to be a part of that. Um, So thanks for tuning in today, everyone. I want to pray for you. uh, And we hope that you'll have a great week. Please feel free to contact me um, uh, at embertide.ca if you're interested in covenant partnership. And we would love to have a chat with you. Let me pray. God, we just thank you so much that you have called us into a covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That we have this new covenant marked by his blood. And so, God, we just ask that in the midst of the goodness of your gospel and the goodness of your love uh, for us, that we would live that out here in in Hampton, the surrounding areas, wherever anyone who might be watching us is tuned in. We just pray that you would use them to accomplish your mission wherever they are. 
God, we thank you so much that your Holy Spirit goes before us and that it's working within us and transforming us uh, and shaping us into to more of your likeness. And so, God, we just pray that you would help us to renew our commitment to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did so that you might receive the glory, so that we might see new brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we might see your kingdom expand in, in whatever area you've planted us in. And so we pray all these things in the power of your name. Amen. Amen.